Thumbs up, yeah. I, I guess we get going. Good morning. So um, let me just reset this, give the thumbs up. And this one. Wonderful. Good morning. Welcome to day two. I guess everyone had a very good first day from what I heard. And hopefully you're well fed now. Um, just to get to know you, who arrived and traveled to the conference uh, from outside New Zealand? I expect at least one hand. Oh, yeah, a few hands. Excellent. Hi, Lynn. Um, you're well informed. <laughs> you will know half my talk um, because he came through the international border. And I'm going to talk about biosecurity and uh, what we're doing in that space. Have you seen one of those before? And I'm talking about the poster and not the bug. If you have seen the actual <laughs> bug, talk to me straight away. <laughs> but you find these um, at the port, in magazines. Um, it's one of the media campaigns that the Ministry for Primary Industries, which is a big organization and I happen to work for them, uh, is running. Um, and part of the mission is biosecurity, keeping pests out of the country. And one of the pests we're really, really concerned with is what's called the brown marmorated stink bug. It's a mouthful. And um, yeah, stink bug will do. We don't want it in the country. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why and how that happens. Um, but to get an idea, um, what happens is like we want to know we have lots of traps. So to warm you up to this, what do you think is the figure? Thousand? Ten thousand. Hundred thousand. How big is New Zealand? <laughs> okay, I give you a hint. Uh, over two hundred sixty thousand square kilometers. So across all pests, not only insects and bugs, um, it's for all kinds of stuff. It's sixty thousand traps kind of deployed right now through the country. Not equally, but if you just spread it out and say, okay, it's like four and a half square kilometers per trap, it's not too bad. But then, because we have to cover so many different species, it's really hard. So we rely on other measures to actually get to know kind of if something is in the country. Because traps work as an early warning system. That's kind of the first thing. If you're from Auckland, um, about two years ago, uh, Queen's friend uh, fruit fly. You'll hear it about that. It was here in Greyland, right in the city, so not somewhere in the countryside. Um, they found a the larvae. And um, it can really destroy the crops. And um, at the end of the whole thing, we found over 20, got eradicated, and hasn't been seen back since. Um, so that was successful. It was really good. So it's many different species, but we're really interested today in actual bugs and shield bugs. So why are we doing this? One is trade. Over 65% of New Zealand's GDP is primary industries. Forestry, fisheries, fruit, veg, dairy, all that stuff. So if that gets hit, everyone gets hit in the pocket. So protecting that industry is utterly important. Um, there are outbreaks. You will see it in the press from time to time. So we have to deal with that. And when it happens, we want to control it. And again, we can't do it on our own. So a constant idea is how to engage the public. And because most people have a mobile phone with a camera, pretty good resolution, I'm going to talk about how we're actually trying to use image recognition to give it into the hands of the public eventually to actually detect these things. We think, oh, that looks suspicious, and I heard about it. Snap and say, like, OK, is this good or not? So this is what uh, I'm going to run you through. Mainly the idea, kind of the whole concept, what we're trying to do. And again, it's a proof of concept. We're right in the middle of it. So this runs until March, roughly. So you don't see anything polished and finished. I'm just giving you an insight in terms of what we tried, what we learned, how we put it together, 
in that there is a ton of Python in the backend. Um, bit of machine learning. It's not a deep dive or anything. It's just you know high level. Okay, what are we using? What it looks like. Um, don't worry too much about it. Um, as they say, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Um, so we're going to use that, and we'll see kind of there are many, many good libraries, lots of help, and good stuff out there. So you don't actually have to be at all the expert to get at least a prototype out or give it a try, get a feeling for it. A bit of taxonomy. So that will be your biology class section of the day. Um, we're doing a bit of taxonomy 101, because that becomes really important for kind of matching up data and kind of what we're feeding in and what we're using there. And then how we go about getting the data. Um, tools and environments, that's the most Python-y bit of the whole talk. And then putting it all together and showing a little bit kind of how far we got and what we have so far and what it looks like. So the Ministry of Primary Industries is running a research and technology practice now for almost two years. And the idea is we're picking up ideas out from the business, out from the public, get a sponsor, senior management, and say, yep, let's try that. And they put a bit of money into it, and we bring people together, often outside uh, the agency, either across agencies, universities, industry. And for this in um, effort, it was uh, or is currently University of Canterbury, YCADO, Landcare Research, and a few other um, entities. The idea is that we want to reduce the workload on our staff, because everything that gets reported, and we have a hotline where people can call up and say, like, hey, I found this in my dustbin or in my shed. Um, it gets investigated. It gets triaged. It's largely a manual process. Um, we're running three laboratories throughout the country, animal health and plant health. Animal health is like sick horses on that, so if you're importing, exporting a racehorse, that's where you have to go. Um, fungi, myrtle rust, you will have heard it in the news, that's plant health. Um, and apart from the insects, obviously, they do fungi and all kinds of bacteria and viruses and whatnot as well. So if we launch a public campaign, the workload increases. And our scientists look at a lot of stuff that is not relevant at all. And it could be, with a bit of knowledge, a bit of insight, could be sorted and triaged out. Then we want to, because New Zealand has like a lot of coastline and uh, kind of like borders, we want to increase the surveillance of what comes in through the ports, cruise ships, for example, freighters, airplanes, and whatnot, and engage people who want to help and make it easy. Right now, it's not necessarily that easy. I mean, yes, you can um, call up, go to a telephone line, um, report it on a web page. Um, if you're actually a farm manager, you'll be kind of more kind of knowledgeable in kind of what to do. But just for the members of the public, it's actually still pretty hard to make it quick and easy. You might have seen it like with city councils. It's like, oh, there is um, a broken street lamp. You want to report that. By the time you've told the council, kind of it's there and spoken and kind of can you fix it, it's quite a process. And so you see all these apps rolling out um, that make it actually snap it, report it, 10 seconds, click, done. So that's behind that as well in public engagement. And hopefully that we can detect it early because the earlier we get in there, the easier it is to do something about it and hopefully eradicate it. So in the laboratory, because I said kind of people report it and stuff comes in, you actually see typically images like that. And yeah, it could be identified as a kiwi, but it's actually for size. So we're actually getting images of like, okay, yeah, that's how big the dollar coin is, and that's how big is what I found. Um, we see like stuff from packaging. We see the actual kind of like bugs pretty close up and you know turned around, and then obviously kind of where they were directly found on fruit in the wild um, as larvae, early stages, or kind of later on. And every case that's reported and that's worth looking at becomes a case file that's investigated in the laboratory. 
um, not only visually and matched by entomologists, you kind of know, okay, you're looking for how many legs, what does the antenna look like of the uh, insect and things like that, and then match it because a lot of them can look quite similar, but they're different species and they have a uh, different impact on the environment. Um, gene testing, kind of like crunch it up. And that could be also technology of the future where instead of like taking the photo, for example, in traps, kind of the pheromones or um, kind of like parts of the insect get just DNA analyzed on the go. And once that blips up, that triggers also that we have to look into it. Um, but right now, focus is on, okay, can we actually use everything that's coming in, all our case files, and make the analysis and the triaging a bit easier so that the experts only look at what's really necessary. We have databases, information systems, all kinds of stuff, and I just picked one of them, um, that actually captures every case um, we got analyzed, and I'm showing a little bit of the data, kind of what usually happens. Uh, what was the species? Where was it found? Um, and information around it. So we can go actually back in time and see also look for patterns and things like that. Um, that informs also the public engagement, but it doesn't contain everything. And because um, we are, as MPI, I'm, I'm the only one in the space, there are other sources as well. So part of the trouble is kind of like bringing it all together in terms of the actual information and then um, analyzing it. Right. A little bit about the machine learning part. It's a buzzword. Another talk previously here as well hear about it all the time. Um, for me, it's, it's quite a paradigm shift from discrete programming. You know, you have the insight, you know how to uh, set up and write your filter to something that is more fuzzy um, in terms of you can't really hang your debugger of it anymore. Um, you can't, you know, really trace it. Um, it is, in a way, the magic. And someone told me, like, well, the magic is mainly fancy stats. Right. Um, it is fancy stats, but it's actually wider field than that. Um, machine learning is a, is a wild field. And just for an overview, um, oopsie, an overview, um, distinguish between the supervised and the unsupervised learning. Unsupervised is really nice because you set the machine up to learn itself. Recent case was. Um, learn to play um, Go without actually being trained to do so on the basic rules. Figure it out yourself. Play so on so many games, things like that. Um, for an entry point, because we actually also wanted to know kind of what we're doing while we're developing this app, uh, we said, like, now we're not even uh, starting to look at that. We go down the supervised learning route. And as you've seen initially in the images that are coming in, I mean, we have to be also pretty clear kind of what goes in there and what we are training on. Um, so we know our data set at the end pretty well as well. So it shouldn't be that much more effort. Um, then going down the regression route and then into neural networks. And there, especially, uh, convolution neural networks. Mouthful. But it's because images um, as input data they're big. Imagine kind of like a standard smartphone and the re resolution you get from an image and then each pixel um, with red, green, and blue. Kind of a, an image itself can be easily a couple of megabytes. And that's just one input point and then you map it all out, um, usually in this fashion. And it becomes really, really big. And the deep part from the deep learning and deep neural network uh, comes from how many layers you have in the middle. Um, I guess a lot of you will have seen this before, but the image, every pixel mapped to an input node, stuff in the middle, and here's the output node. And the output nodes determine which classes. In this example, this is kind of the 101 from machine learning, uh, recognize handwritten digits. Um, 
it could be 0 to 9. In our case, it'll be what species is it? Uh, so our cl classes back here will look different. To set this up is quite tricky. It's hard. You need a lot of knowledge. Lucky enough, the people who are that smart make pre-cooked networks available. It's pre-trained. And there are plenty of them around. One well-known is ResNet, for example. I mean, if you look at um, stuff from Facebook, Google, and so on, kind of like all the bigger players, they actually put it out there in open source, usually on GitHub. So you find it there. And they have all their pros and cons, because there is no free lunch. It's not like, hey, here's the universal algorithm, and here's your, your network, and it can classify anything. It really depends on your input data and what you're trying to solve. So in that way, it's still specific. So if you're talking about facial image recognition, different to identifying insects. And funny enough, there isn't that much out there on insects, and not even on scale. It's actually, if you look into it, it's a hard target. It's small. A lot of them look the same, and even if it's the same, because when they grow from larvae to actually the adult one, um, they change quite a lot. And there's a lot of variety, um, almost like with humans. Um, we were lucky enough that we just could fall back on one of these pre-cooked networks. And um, some of them um, are pre-trained on like a thousand categories. Um, from chairs, dogs, cats, whatnot. And then you can cross-train them. So you actually take your pre-trained network, create your own classes, and then say, okay, we are only actually changing the last layer here to map it back to kind of your new categories. So you don't need the enormous grunt, the deep insight, to actually build and then run your own neural network from scratch. And I haven't touched on that before. I only got into that part about a year ago. And it's actually amazing how well that works. Before it was really kind of like, OK, yeah, we're trained from scratch. And can I convince my boss to invest into the nice machines with the fancy GPUs and good graphics cards? Again, we were a bit lucky because uh, at my work, we have a big GIS department, um, geospatial information systems, and um, they have nice grunting machines, so you can hijack them. Um, however, remember kind of the initial case why we're doing this? We want to have it running on mobile phones. And they're amazingly grunty, but they're not that grunty that can run kind of like a standard network and just like recognition after you trained it. So you want something um, a bit more lightweight. The other thing is, if you're training, um, you want to actually match your model to what you're training for. So if I find a model on uh, share trading, not good match for insects. But if I have something that is animals or um, birds, somewhere kind of like in that realm, it might actually be a good basis to actually cross-train it and then use it for insects. And there are mechanisms in there, and the tool set is getting actually really good to verify that. Um, in the back end, we are using TensorFlow because there's so much out there, and um, especially at the universities, everyone is using it, or at least New Zealand seems to use it. Um, so that was almost by default. But then the tool set around that it's becoming really good. We can actually visualize and kind of like get an insight in the data. So if you remember back kind of where it was talking about, okay, it's not discrete programming anymore. You can't hang your debugger into this thing. Well, this becomes your debugger. This creates your insight. And you can actually then tell, is the machine learning a fit that is too close? So like an exact match or is it kind of like loose enough that it actually can pick up stuff that is kind of similar or not? 
think of it as a puzzle. You have all the pieces, and your actual image in the puzzle is mm, beautiful New Zealand landscape, blue sky, and Mount Cook. A lot of the pieces will be just blue. It will be green, grassy, and then rocks and crevices and things like that. So you can, I'm not sure how you do puzzles, but I actually sort it just by color and go like, okay, all blue, all rocky stuff, grass, and so on. And then once you have it categorized that way, you say like, okay, there's nothing much kind of in the sky pieces. Um, I start with something that's easy to recognize, kind of where I can find a pattern. And then looking for these patterns, kind of training on that, that's kind of what you can read out of these things as well. What is it picking up on? How does it match it? And after a few tries and back and forth, we landed on this one, um, Google's mobile net model. It's out there. Everyone can download and use it. There's a lot of documentation around it. And it is meant really as mobile first. So researchers who came up with that, they really had in mind, okay, this thing has to run on a mobile phone at the end of the day. And in comparison to other models we touched on, it is actually really small. So in terms of your actual footprint on the device, it's insanely fast. Um, it, I, I was really amazed kind of in terms of like how fast it can actually crunch uh, an image that comes directly from your camera. And yes, there's a payoff in terms of accuracy. Even with the same training and being careful, you don't hit, this, hit the same um, rate. And some nets we were hitting kind of like up to uh, 90, 92%. And there we had a drop like to 88%, things like that. So you have to trade it off. But you have a couple of parameters in there where you can actually do the trade off. And as mobile phones become more powerful, you can dial it without actually changing them too much of, and, or pick another model. And so far, the experience has been really good with it. And I can recommend you use or look into it. So now with all this, we have picked the model. We want to train it. We have input data. I showed you the stuff from the lab. Now we have to actually label it because we have to find our categories and we can be pretty sure we want a stink bug category or a nasty stink bug category or I don't want it in New Zealand category and things like that. Um, if you then actually look into kind of what's available and what we can feed in, it um, doesn't work very well. Biology itself had that problem of labeling specimen animals, things like that, plants, for a long time. And biological taxonomy is an important part of entomology and actually identifying, okay, this species is exactly that if I identify it. It's not a science where it's stable once something is identified things actually got also moved around. And you'll find that in the labeling as well. It's like, oh yeah, in 1758, it was here. But now in 1982, it's here. It's actually the same kind of like connection, but say, oh no, you actually belong here. You don't belong to the dogs, you belong to the cats. Um, for New Zealand, the NZOR is the reference. So if you're making policy, um, if you're importing, exporting, things like that, everything is determined by kind of, okay, how is it categorized in there? And it's species that are of interest to New Zealand. So it's not necessarily all the species in New Zealand, and that's it. So for example, brown marmorated stink bug is in there um, because it's of interest. And it's also not everything, uh, not worldwide. So it's really um, specific, and it gets extended all the time. I mean, that's why I have the numbers there and kind of the snapshot of like, hey, that's where it currently sits. Um, it's a lot, but we also found out it's kind of okay, there, there are gaps, kind of, we need to kind of some things that we can label through this mechanism. And we want to do it automatically if we can. So that's where we get our labels from. That's kind of what we agreed on. 
Yeah? We could, don't call it stink bug. We call it by its scientific name. So to give you a better taste for it, because that's pretty, well, I found it abstract. I mean, I didn't finish biology at school, so I skipped that bit. So there, I had to go back and learn all about it. So um, let's look up our common house cat. And it's an uh, open interface. You can pull it anytime. You don't need an API key or anything. Um, it's really nicely documented, so if you go there, and you just fire this request with, and I picked here the scientific name, Scatus, you get an API response. And it's a pretty long response. If I had it on the screen, kind of, it would be really kind of like long and small. But it contains a lot of information. And not only where it's sitting in the taxonomy in the tree, and I'm going to show you that in more detail in a moment, um, it's also, is it actually present in New Zealand? Where? Is it related to um, farm, husbandry, things like that? Is it out in the wild? Um, where can I find more references? Things like that. It's all kept in there. So if you're interested in the topic, it's well worth having a look. And um, it's a nice resource. So one of the things that comes out from the response is the actual classification. And This is just one way of doing it. If you look actually into biology taxonomy, there are many ways of doing it. Um, for us, what's really actually the important bit is the class. Mammal, right, guess that much. The actual family, family of cats, and then the species. And even if we can't get the species level, if we have the genus or the family, that's all really good because that gives us an idea where are we on the tree of life, and is this of interest or not? Does it have to go in front of a scientist and needs investigation? Do we have to set up a parameter and do the whole spiel of, okay, we have an incursion, and please don't take your grapes out of Greyland. So keep these ones in mind, because everything else is going to disappear again. And um, how we do it with our input imagery. So I've picked four target species. They're of interest. They're not the brown marmorated stink bugs, um, but they can look pretty similar. And some of them are harmful, some of them are not. And there's your taxonomy. And hopefully we can get down to the last level. However, what we're actually interested in, we're cutting everything off to the left, is shield bugs. Kind of from there on, kind of dive down, and our labeling is going to contain only things below that. And we're not going to train on anything else. So we're specializing our network and our setup from there on down, and pick our sources accordingly. Um, the Environment Lab uh, that also looks after plant health is here in Auckland. And they have a collection. They have actually a room with all kinds of specimens. It looks like a museum. You have these big drawers. You pull them out, and um, then you can pick out a green shield bug. You can actually look at them. And the scientists literally kind of compare to the specimen or to um, libraries and things like that. For all the case files, it gets dumped into a semi-structured file system. And it was never geared for machine learning. So the first trying to have just saying like, oh yeah, there will be a scientific name in there, and we just troll everything and feed everything in, just blew up horribly. It didn't work, and that's kind of where we found the dollar coins and where the labeling was wrong and things like that. And it's not a huge set um, that we were looking at initially, just uh, over 18,000 images, but still, you don't want to do it all by hand. So, Python to the rescue, we did some mapping. And we used the API that I've shown you before, plus there are a few other APIs around. So if that failed and Enzor wasn't available to provide us with the details, or not a good match, then uh, we could use other APIs. They also provide a score. How precisely have you hit actually a name? And with that, because if you look at the um, hierarchical path here, you have different levels of the taxonomy, different hits. 
We said, like, oh, astigmata. All right, that's a high score, high hit. This one here, well, yes, it'll find it, but it doesn't know what to do with this bit. So it'll be a match, but not as a high score. And then in combination of the whole path of all the scores, you can say, okay, this is a pretty good match, and you have your whole taxonomy tree. And then we map it out, fill the gaps, and find our label. And then we rely more or less, okay, this image, is this species, that's our label. And that's how we built our um, training catalog. At the end of the day, it wasn't enough initially. Our first run, which was um, a bit more stringent, had like 1,000 images across um, 10 categories. It's good enough to give it a go, um, but you land roughly um, around 100 images for each category, which is not huge input for machine learning. 500 would have been really good, more than 1,000, even better. And if you Google it, it doesn't match really. A lot of the stuff that comes back from Google is actually not right. If you really have an expert looking at it, it's like, oh no, that's an Instar 3 and it's not this species. Okay. So we couldn't use that. Um, it's hard to get hold of, despite different organizations nationally, like in Canada and Chile and Australia and so on, they're running kind of similar programs and they're interested in it. Um, and now what we're diving into is DIY approach. As I said, kind of we have a collection, we have the extra specimen, take a camera, and let's take plenty of images. Um, that's the next step. We haven't done that yet, because so I'm really curious to see kind of what the result is there. All right. What did we use? Um, our office environment is uh, Windows, and uh, our line of business applications run in that environment. So there's no way around it. But then um, for certain systems, we have the uh, Linux VMs out there, and also on Amazon, it's just easy to get kind of the pre prep machine. You don't have to do kind of the whole install. It's like um, Docker on demand. You just deploy it, it's all set up, it's all right there. You can start using it, and you don't have to fiddle with, oh, do I have the right driver for your graphics card? Is CUDA version matching my TensorFlow and all these things? Um, and then also uh, Mac OS, uh, especially uh, from academia, um, because people will work on them. So it has to go across everything. And Python works really nice for every kind of under Linux and Windows. It was always a bit of a mission. What I found, and um, heard from other people also, um, Anaconda is really nice. And it actually made our job in transferring between these different environments in the setup much, much easier. So even having looked at that in terms of your package manager or if you have to go between environments, highly recommended. Um, was really good. And it actually behaves under Windows. Especially we can compile in binary stuff like in NumPy and whatnot. Um, it's download and it works kind of for the architectures we had. And then um, still Python 3.5. Um, 3.6, latest version. And TensorFlow itself works on that quite fine, but a lot of the stuff around it hasn't caught up. Um, and please, yeah, no, no Python 2. It's really not necessary, so we haven't touched that. Um, TensorFlow for uh, 1.4 is pretty recent, and it came with a nice update in terms of like the tooling. I alluded a little bit to it in terms of the graphing. Uh, there's a tool tensor board um, that has been there for a bit, but now comes as part of the package. No extra install and whatnot. And it's almost like pip install TensorFlow and you're done. That's how nice it has become. After I said that, it won't work anymore. Um, but <laughs> so far was the experience. Um, Jupyter was really um, helpful. Uh, Jupyter is an environment where, uh, not like an IDE, you treat your code as a document. And some people really hate on it, and some people really like it. Um, because you don't do proper programming in the Jupyter environment. Um, and yes, uh, I wouldn't use it like for everything, but if you have to do an analysis, if you have investigating, it's exploratory, if you have to exchange information with other people, you want to document it on the fly and output it, um, really nice environment, and it helped us a lot. Um, Pandas, um, which is in the Linux community also kind of like everywhere, um, was really nice to use, and I almost uh, used it as an in-memory database for 
tap your data and made the whole job of kind of like handling your stuff easier and uh, the printers. And then for the, the prototype bottle, which is a micro web framework, um, I guess most of you will be familiar with it. The nice thing is it's just really literally one file and uh, if you have like three pages and endpoints you serve and that's it. It's really easy, it's really fast. And um, yeah, it was, was nice to use. Um, lots of other stuff around it, but especially for the data ingestion, trawling through um, file systems, downloading stuff from databases, combining it, matching it with a taxonomy API, and all this lifting, shifting, filtering, extracting, transforming, loading. Um, we did it all in Python, and it worked beautifully. It worked really, really well. So that's what it currently looks like. And it's not really a mobile app. No, it's just kind of the browser window looking like a mobile app. So we haven't done the part where you actually can deploy it as a native app and run it with a mobile net uh, backend on the mobile phone, most likely Android. Um, but we haven't really figured that bit out yet. But to give a look and feel, kind of we have this as a working thing. We can actually go upload your image and do that. Plunk a few tags in there. Now that, crunch, crunch. And it comes back currently with a hit score. I mean, it doesn't look any beautiful or anything, but 0.87%. So it's pretty sure Matulus Nasalis, that's that one. And it actually is. And I wouldn't show you an example where it didn't work, right? Yeah, and so you can go now, upload the image, and taking that out to our business. And so it's like, because I could show that on the command line, right? I just run the shell script, point it to the image, spits out the numbers, the same thing. It's amazing how much more attention this gets because it's a web page. So pro tip, if you're showing something where you think like, yeah, the whole magic is just you know, running the background and you have one line of output, make a web page, make it with colors. Make this green. Green is good. So, just to wrap it up, um, as I mentioned, it was a lot of Python. I mean, natively, kind of with TensorFlow, we don't have a choice, um, but also for um, the ETL, getting the data in, looking at images, but not talking to APIs. Um, it was a good experience and very little context switching. Usually in our environment, we go then between uh, Java, C Sharp, a bit of PowerShell, a bit of Bash, and um, yeah, it takes actually a toll. Um, here, it was almost a monoculture, which doesn't sound good, but it actually really, really helped. The tooling and the frameworks, and I mentioned that before, they're getting really, really good. And there's so much help out there and so many tutorials. Someone told me there is actually no good business model with machine learning right now, apart from you're providing courses, you're training people, or you're NVIDIA and you're selling GPUs. Everything else is not making money really yet. Um, will change. But yeah, there is a ton of um, good stuff out there, and um, you can really play and um, experience it. At some point, you just have to go home. <laughs> it is really helpful, because you think, like, now this has to work. And I guess it's kind of the shared experience here as well. But yeah, sleep helps. Highly recommended. So for that, I hope you learned a bit about stink bugs by security in New Zealand, what we're trying to do with this project. And thank you very much. <laughs>